Drink your fool heads off. But I tell you, I am not done with you. I will be ready when you've decided to become men with dignity. But little people together make giants. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Kite, and we're here in Liverpool, England, home of the Beatles. The reason I'm here is that I am workshopping a play I'm writing through the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts, which was founded by Paul McCartney 11 years ago. And the play is on a fascinating period in Nova Scotia history when poor fishermen, farmers and miners were revolutionized by two rebel priests who brought cooperation and adult education of communities. These priests were Father Jimmy Tompkins and Father Moses Cody, and they started a social economic movement called the Antigonish Movement. Now we are standing in Tompkinsville, which is the home of the first cooperative housing project in North America. And just up the road was the home of my great uncle, Joe Laban, who was one of the leaders of this movement. I grew up having Sunday dinner in this house. I spent every Christmas here. It was here where I first heard stories of Father Jimmy Tompkins and Father Moses Cody. But it wasn't until I started researching my play that I realized what amazing stories had happened right in my own backyard. All of a sudden, I realized that my Uncle Joe was no ordinary Joe. He was a pioneer of social justice. It was his story that inspired me to write my play. Tompkinsville was the first cooperative housing project in North America, but it's just one of many amazing stories about Father Jimmy Tompkins, Father Moses Cody, and the Antigonish Movement. If any place could be said to be the birthplace of the Antigonish movement, it would be right here in Little Dover, Guysborough County, just down the shore from Canso, the oldest fishing port in North America. In the 1920s, Little Dover was like hundreds of other small fishing communities along the coastline of the Maritime Provinces. People struggled to eke out a living from the sea, only to see their efforts enrich the merchants, while they themselves lived in desperate poverty with little hope. Many time zones away, in the northeast corner of the African continent and deep in the highland mountains of Ethiopia, is a world-famous coffee-producing area called Yuga Shefi. Here, coffee farmers bring their hand-picked coffee beans to this washing station to be processed and eventually sent all over the world. Like hundreds of other rural communities throughout Africa, people here work hard to maintain their homes and raise their children. The parallels with Maritime Canada in the 1930s are remarkable. The lessons learned in Little Dover in the 30s and 40s are still relevant in the developing world today. It's a beautiful day in Little Dover. It's hard to believe that three generations ago, People came from all over the world to this isolated village to see a revolution in the making. You have to think back in your mind about what it was like to be a fisherman or to be a farmer in that day. I saw my father grow fields of vegetables and turnips and that type of thing and having to feed them to the cows because he couldn't sell them during the Depression. Or he had to sell beautiful Ayrshire cows for $40 to pay the taxes. I mean, that was the time. And unless you can get into your mind what it was like in that time, it's very difficult to understand why the Antigonish movement took place at that particular time with these particular people. For generations, a large number of these people of the Maritimes have combined their fishing with work in the lumber camps and small farming on the side. But in spite of the extra activities, in the past it was a meager living for the fishermen. I remember back in the 1920s, 
I was working for myself then. It wasn't an easy living. We always had fish to eat. Nearly always dried cod for sure. But it was good eating. There were only three out of the whole village who had the books or boots for going to school that year. My cousin's boy had bread and molasses. Most of the people in the village were going around half starved, even if they wouldn't admit it. My uncle, Ellie Grinell, had told me they were get up in the morning to go fishing, the, and there might be a couple of pieces of bread. My grandfather wouldn't eat it. He'd leave it for his, for the children, and the older children, my father and his brother, well, they'd get up and they, they wouldn't leave it. They wouldn't eat it. They'd leave it for the younger children. Basically, it was, it was hard times. The people were intelligent. Like I said, these old skippers could go out for days and come back and hit the same spot, the same buoy. It's just a sign of the times. Every every little fishing village was probably the same way. Large numbers of people are leaving. They're leaving uh, Nova Scotia generally, and they're leaving this place by the hundreds of thousands. And not only that, but the whole world is changing and it's becoming industrialized. And so the things that people did for years, for really centuries, the production that was family-based, all of this is changing very, very rapidly. And people are kind of lost as to what they're going to do with this new world that's developing. But the fishermen were at the mercy of the merchants. They needed they needed the merchants to give those to give them credit in the fall of the year or whatever, so they could get the materials to build their lobster traps, get the food to feed their families through the winter. And the merchant basically gave them things like a tea or molasses, oil, kerosene for the lamps, all of those kinds of things that people used every day, they got from the merchant. And with the understanding that in the spring of the year when the fishermen began lobster fishing, that they'd sell their lobsters to these merchants and merchants would get paid for the material they gave them during the winter. So you had on the one side all the things you, you took in, and on the other side you had all the things you bought, and at the end of the year when you went to settle up, you may find out that you had 60 cents or two dollars or something like that that was clear to your name, or you may even find that you were owing money. But a dollar fifty-nine, I could not believe it. A dollar fifty-nine cents for two hundred and fourteen pounds of fish. That's less than a cent a pound. My uncle, Ellie Grinell, had told me they were selling their lobsters by the piece. They get a cent a piece for a lobster, not a pound, not a cent a pound, a cent a piece. That so goes the story where he told me they throw all the big ones overboard, they have a boatload of lobsters, and keep the smaller ones and get you know, get more small ones in the boat. You have merchants that were controlling your what you eat and when you eat and what you needed for fishing. And you're, you basically didn't have a, a whole lot of ammunition to fight with. Mm -hmm. You had a bunch of little children home that depended on you in those days for big families. Then came Dr. J.J. Tompkins to set the heather on fire, as Nova Scotians say. Don't despair, he told the fishermen. Try to do something for yourself. Of the government, he demanded, do something about the desperate plight of the fishermen, but do it quickly. Jimmy Tompkins was definitely, uh, let's say, I'd say he was a spokesman for the social teaching of the Christian church. He, he s tried to force people to think, to be critical, ask questions, why? Don't just accept what people tell you. Jimmy Tompkins had a very, very fertile mind and he was at this game for a very long time before Cody became interested. Tompkins uh, was the type of person who was constantly getting ideas. And once he got an idea, he buttonholed you. And you might as well surrender early because there was no shaking him. The Anakinish movement was not achieved because they came up with some very good ideas and said to the people, this is what we must do. No. The reality is that there was a fierce struggle 
over a period of time by a large number of people who didn't want to see this movement move. Tompkins got in trouble because he said, look, St. Evex is pretty small, Acadia is small, we should all get together and use all our brains, getting all the faculties and professors involved in the local area, using their brains to solve all the problems of poverty in Atlantic Canada. The bishop couldn't get um, Tompkins to toe the line, so he shipped them off to Kensal, which was a pretty terrible assignment. Yeah, first of all, there was no road in there. You went down by boat. Tompkins was a very frail, delicate person never in very strong health, a tiny bit of a human being, and he arrived at a house with had no, as far as I know, not even running water, let alone electricity. So it meant that Tompkins, vice president of the university, already with an honorary degree from Mount Allison, later to get an honorary degree from Harvard University, is sent to a parish which doesn't have very many resources. What does he do? He starts educating people down there. He starts bringing them into the Glebe House. He's doing literacy training. When he was in Kansas, in the little store, in the evening, he'd have books and leaflets and he'd collar people in the store. They had a little pot-bellied stove and he'd get people to sit down and talk about what was going on in the world, about economics and politics. And when Canada has its anniversary, 1927, 1867, 1927, 60 years of Canadian Confederation. What does he do? Well, he gets the people agitated. Look, you're in a terrible state. What should you do? You should protest. You should say, what's the good of being in Canada? Fly the flag upside down. Upside down is a symbol of distress. It was July 1st, 1927. I remember that day as if it were yesterday. We were all celebrating Canada's anniversary. What a great, great country, great uh, flags and everything, pipes and music. Dr. Jimmy was uh, fairly new in Council. Some of them still didn't know him too well. And they said, uh, would you like to say a word or two? Yes, he said. And his first remark, what are you celebrating for? What did Confederation do for you people. I know some of you are still on your bare feet. Some of you probably didn't have any breakfast this morning. I know the conditions out among, among you. Four or five children sleeping in the one bed and little huts with almost mud floors in some of these places. And you're here to celebrate. And this is really where the whole thing started from. And he brings the press in. The press come in because he's a, he's a, he's a well-known man. He's a literate man. He's a man that has been vice president of the university. And he brings in the press, and they see this going on in Kansas, and they say, what is the crisis that's happening to the people? Look at what's happening to people. People are having a very, very hard time. They're in a, they're in a crisis. And so as a consequence, they have the Royal Commission comes directly out of that. 